Welcome, my name is Kafui Day. Uh, 4th August in Ghana is celebrated as Founders Day. The question is, who founded Ghana? Before we get to the answer with my guest, I just remind you that uh, you want to be subscribing to this channel and hitting the notification bell so that when brand new videos come up, you'll be the first to get the information. And now to my guest, who is a lawyer and a historian, a lover of things that happened in the past and how significant they are to the people of today and the future. Yao Anochi Frimpong, you're welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, happy Founders Day. And for me, the question is, who founded Ghana? It's a simple question, but it has possibly many answers. Indeed. Let's start from the beginning. Yeah, to start from the Ghana. beginning. Ghana. Where, um, where did the concept of Ghana come from or the idea of Ghana come from? It's like asking a lawyer, what is law? You understand? Then you are encouraging him to write a lot of theses mm -hmm. because it's a very vexed question. Mm -hmm. Or asking a philosopher, what is the truth? It's not easy to come by. Now, when you ask anybody uh, who founded Ghana, it is not an easy answer. And that will take you to the beginning of things, as you rightly said. The word, the name, the concept, the entity, Ghana, you know, is first mentioned in the Sahara, Many, many years ago, more than 600 years before Kwame Nkrumah mentioned the word Ghana, at long last, the battle has ended, and Ghana, your beloved nation, is free forever. That was when we knew the word or the name Ghana. It was an empire. Today, we we'll say that uh, it is traced to the area between Mali, southern Mauritania, uh, and then the eastern part of Guinea mm. it was a very vast empire. This was the Ghana Empire. The Ghana Empire. Mm. And it was the first of the Western Sudanese empires. We had three Western Sudanese empires, Ghana, uh, Mali, and Songhai. And we are told that Ghana, which was the first of the empires, was an empire noted for gold, very splendid. Anytime the mention of Ghana came in, you immediately thought of gold. And it became associated with us somehow because of certain similarities. For example, the people were surrounded by Muslims, but these people called, today we call Ghanaians, mm -hmm. were identified as people who rather believed in Ancestral worship. Okay, so this is the, the, the inhabitants of the kingdom of Ghana. Ghana. Okay. They, they believed in ancestral worship. Secondly, because they believed in ancestral worship, they buried the dead with gold. They poured libation. Their women wore earrings. And they wore clothes as most of the Akans and then the Gans and the, the Ewes do. And they also discovered that some of the people were matrilineal in nature. Mm. Just like the Akans. Just as the Akans. Mm. But the bigger tribe there was called the Soninke. Mm -hmm. You know, and today we have Gans and others, Patrilineal. But the few people there, very, very minute people being a matrilineal. Mm. And we discovered that we believe that they will be the Akans. You know, and then after some time, the empire fell. It fell because uh, Mali conquered it. Mm. And we are told that we continued to stay there until uh, Mansa Musa came and ensured that everybody in the kingdom, in the new empire, Mali, would belong to the Islamic religion. Mansa Musa is, the, is, the, is this king who went on, famously went on uh, The pilgrimage to, to Mecca, uh, Mecca. And caused inflation in Egypt for Very good. Took many plenty years. of gold. our gold away. Mm. He went, and when they weighed the gold, it became the biggest <laughs> amount that could be imagined anywhere in the world. Mm. And we are told that he's the richest man Ever. in history. Mm. But the problem is that he went with all the gold and never came back 
with it. And uh, Mali was never to become as it was again. And of course, I think they attracted the attention of the Westerners, and then that's how that everybody had their attention. Portuguese and so all these people coming down. Uh, on one hand, he was a great man. <clears throat> on the other, he did us a big disservice. <laughs> but what is important is the fact that our people, because of their religion, hated Islam then. Mm -hmm. Our people will also hate Islam because in those days, if you were a royal, you should ensure that, uh, do you call it knife, the knife or cutlass or machete would never have touched your body. Mm. And in Islam, you know, you have to be circumcised. Indeed. And so in those days, I'm telling you the truth, the girls and then the northerners and the Ewes, the Akans, who are all circumcised today, you know, were not. Once you are royal, you should not go through that. And so our people will have to leave that place because we are led by royals. And if my royal will have to be circumcised in order to have his peace of mind, mm -hmm. then he will leave, lead me to leave that place entirely. And we came along the Volta. You know, the Volta travels from the north to the south. And we didn't know much geography. The only geography that would lead you secure, you would never fail, is traveling along the river banks. Because everybody knows that the river will flow from somewhere as its source. And then the mouth is always the sea. So if you wanted to come down south, it's just the use river. the river and it would aid you. Mm. So that was what we did. So who are these people who left that ancient kingdom, the Ghana Empire, and then find finally found themselves here in, 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 in modern-day Ghana? Largely, they are the... Uh, they, 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 our, we, do, we cannot tell exactly, mm -hmm. but we can say that the Guans were the first to have left. Mm -hmm. You know the Guan people, the Akwapim, mm -hmm. Efutu, Ewutu, Enum, Late, Nkonya, Wura mm -hmm. you understand, yeah. those people. And then the Gonja people, mm -hmm. Gonja people in northern Ghana, yes, they were all part of this. Then after the Guans, we also came, you know, so you will see that these people have languages, the, the, the languages are very mm -hmm. similar. Mm -hmm. And even when I spoke to uh, many Ewe historians, I discovered that the link was there. The Ewes would tell you they came from a place called Ngochie, mm -hmm. and they would tell you that Ngochie, mm -hmm was the eighth settlement, their eighth settlement, when they were coming down. And then why much here? They will explain to you that it was, it's an Akan word because we're all coming together. Why an Akan word? Say, yeah, the eighth in Akan is called what? Enwachi. Enwachi. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then they will say, not, not, no. Any? No, not here, that's the, the town. town. The town in Togo, yes. It's called, what is Enwachi. it? Very good. Mm. So it shows, you see, I want us to, Think about the unity that existed, the oneness that existed. But the more you come down, the more we expand. Mm. That, according to famous, the famous Ewe writer Mamata, it was their eighth settlement, and it was Akans who gave it that name. And it shows that they were all together from one source. Now, having reached here, especially among the Akans, they say that. They were being chased by men on horseback. And so they got to a place where the horses would not be able to penetrate. That is when they got to the forest mm. belt. Mm. And so the Akans settled there, and that was where they had, they had the Bono Techiman kingdom. Those on horseback, were they from the Burkina Faso area, the Mole Dabani people? From the Mole Dabani mm -hmm. People, mm -hmm. because they were the remnants of these Malians. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. So they were those made to chase us. Mm -hmm. So many would not go away like the Gonjas. Mm -hmm. They stayed. The Gonjas stayed. The Moli Dabani people stayed. And then the Akans also would come down to even the to the forest zone. And that was where the Akans settled strictly along the Pra of Finn Basin because they feared leaving the rivers, mm. you know, for agricultural purposes and then uh, for the fact that you would never stray anywhere. Yeah. And those of the accounts who went deeper, went to the 
Komoi uh, uh, Bia area, now in Central Ivory Coast. You know, but let's come down to our own story. It is, we have started by telling you that the word Ghana is not an innovation. Mm. It is variously defined. Some people say it's a land of black people. And that is the reason why the Spanish and then the Portuguese, wherever they found black people, they called them Guineas. Mm. And then the English would prefer Ghana. So we have Papua New Guinea, we have Guinea Bissau, Guinea Conakry, Equatorial Guinea, as well. Equatorial Guinea mm. and then we have Ghana. They mean the same mm. thing, meaning the land of black people. Mm. Some people also say it means the land of gold, but at least they have the same meaning. Mm. And that also shows uh, our nature. We have always been the same. Now, I'm saying that the word Ghana would not be the... Uh, uh, the, the innovation of anybody mm. because it was the name of a certain group of people that lived almost 700 years before we came. So it is not a name that anybody coined. Indeed, in those days when the CPP wanted to win election in Ghana, they said Ghana stands for God has appointed them Kroma already. Please, <laughs> acronym. Never, that mm. acronym. So that means that uh, making the new country called Ghana is Nkrumah's own coinage. Mm. That one can never be accepted anywhere. Just as saying Buzia's name, which is actually from Busia, mm -hmm. like a loan or a debt mm -hmm. among the accounts of people, best university scholar in Africa. It's mm -hmm. just a political uh, word, a, a term, mm -hmm. and we should not take that seriously. Now, back home, you know, everybody would know that we were living peacefully until trade setting. Now, trade has always taken place on this land. We are told that the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians were coming to the West African coast, mm. you know, and some of our people were traveling even to South America. You know, trade has always taken place. Then the first one we could imagine in history was the silent trade, where the Europeans would come, not land actually. They will be on the sea and then light fires for our people to realize that, oh, the people have come. Mm -hmm. Our trade partners have arrived. Then what they needed from our end, always things like dried pepper and then gold, if there were diamonds or anything that they needed from here, cotton, you know, things that they needed from our coast. You know, these people will put all these things there in lots. Then they will set fires again to tell them that you should also bring your goods. And then the people will retreat to the forest. And then these people will come and put their own European goods, you know, blankets, uh, snaps, I mean, liquor, and uh, what you call mirror, all the European goods that we also needed. They will also put this thing down. I wonder how they, they determined their exchange rates because they were not speaking any mutually intelligible language. It was silent. It was the call, that's why it was called the silent mm -hmm. trade. Mm -hmm. But it was mutually intelligible mm -hmm. that when you come and you see that your lot is still standing there, nobody has picked it. Mm -hmm. It means come and top Add it. Add some more. Add okay. some more. All right. okay. So it continued not knowing these people were studying us. The Europeans. The Europeans were studying us. They were learning a lot about us. So why do you think they will come all the way from where they will come from to our place to trade with us? I mean, they needed us more. They were studying that. Then what happened was some time along the line, some of their people really descended, decided to come and stay among our people so that any time, learned our language, so that any time it became difficult, you could fall on the one who had come to stay among us, mm -hmm. married our women. So we started having mulattoes. Mm -hmm. You know, then when they knew they could communicate intelligently with us, that was the time they brought Azambuja, Don Diogo de Azambuja. And we are told that Christopher Columbus was on that trip. He was part of the trip to meet uh, the people at the time. And we are the coast. Mm. And we are told that they first went to Shaman. 
And the people were very smart. They were sensible. So it means we are talking about who founded Ghana. Indeed. Don't forget. Yeah. The Shamar people looking at the massive ships on the sea and the gorgeous manner in which they were dressed said, no, we cannot accept these people. And gave information everywhere along the coast that nobody should accept these foreigners to make them stay on their land. Why? Philosoph very highly philosophical answer. They say that you can see that these people have all the intellect in the world. Look at the way they are dressed. And look at that their house on the sea, mm -hmm. the ship. The ship. Mm -hmm. You can see that the people have got wisdom. They have got everything that man needs to survive except land. That is why they want a place to stay. Mm. So the moment you allow them to stay on their land, they will use their superior wisdom to drive you away and you have nothing to live on. So nobody should accept them except through the existing butter system. So the Shama people drove them away. And then the next stop after Shama was obviously Elmina. Mm -hmm. They came, got down and spoke to the chief there, Nana Kwamina Ansa. And we know the story, FK West history from primary school. Now, look at uh, Azambuja's request that we have always been coming and going. Why don't we stay, build a house, pump in a lot of goods so that you will not wait for six months, one year or two years. For more supplies. Yeah, for more <laughs> supplies. This one, you always have the supply. You just tell us what you need and then they come. And you too, once you have the goods, we also keep buying and then you will see the, what do you call it? Buying and saying, flowing and everybody becoming richer and richer. The Kwamenan said, no, you are making a mistake. You see, you spoke about coming and going. Mm. It is a relationship between the land and the sea. The sea waves will come down to the land. And the beauty of it is that no matter how it rolls to the land, it will go back. It never stays there. It never stays there. Mm. So there is that relationship and you can identify the land, you can identify the sea, and then that mutuality between them, that play, and that is what I want to continue. Kwame Nansa would not understand. And then Kwame Nansa was looking, listen very carefully, Kwame Nansa was looking at the beauty, the glamour of these Europeans, how they were dressed. Just like the Shama people were also looking at them. Well, looking at them. Mm -hmm. the Shama, uh, looking at them. Mm -hmm. And then these people looking at them and say, look at the way you are dressed. And look at um, how almost naked my okay. people mm -hmm. are. What Kwame Nansa did not realize was that the people he referred to as naked were wearing big gold bracelets. Chains, big gold, solid gold. Our women... You know, those days, they didn't have this. They, they had something that I can't call, the fantasy called Amoise, mm -hmm. you know, and then the uh, Ashanti say Tam. Like a covering around the, Very the good. private parts. The private part. Mm -hmm. So, Kwame Nansa will see it as nakedness. But these white people realize that the one that goes around the, uh, the, waist. the waist to support it was, was full of gold. Wow. You understand. <laughs> so <laughs> they were calculating the money. They were calculating the value, the value of yeah. it. But because it was like, common to Kwame, this one was nothing. It's nothing. You it know, is the, but the gold the, the support. Here, yeah. Everybody, gold, gold earrings, yeah, yeah. gold everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, golden crowns everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this man, he thinks his people are naked. They were not naked. Mm -hmm. You understand. So the more he thought his people were far naked, and then. They were nobodies. The more these people told, no, 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 no. This is a gold mine. Is it a question of Kwame uh, Ansa not uh, appreciating the value of what his people were wearing or see, what his people when had? When you are born into anything, it's you don't, for you. Yes, yeah. you don't value mm. what you are born mm. into. You don't. You understand, if you have 100 <laughs> of this, you would want a, a battery smoke. You want smoke, a, 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 a suit and other yeah. things, but never the same thing mm. because you have got 100. Because so at that time, look at the name they gave to that place. Eventually, when he succeeded, he wrote home that they have found a place called the mine, La Mina. The mine full of 
gold, you know, people, for even dead bodies are buried with gold, mm -hmm. and the Europeans will not even Hallelujah. believe that. The mine. You know, the mine, mm -hmm. Lamina, mm -hmm. which today has become Elmina. So that was how it began. And I'm saying that if you are talking about the founders, don't forget Nana Kwamina and Sam because in every good history book covering slavery, colonialism, and black emancipation, they start from Kwame Nansen's statement mm. that the moment we allow you to stay here, you will push us away. Like the land allowing the sea to keep coming to cover the entire land. And indeed, ultimately, that was what happened. So you will see that an African more than uh, 600 years ago was and an illiterate person mm. was highly philosophical. He knew the import of the black white man staying with us here. Should we also recognize the statements of the king of Shaman also? The Shaman because people. They, they also... Yeah, because for them, mm -hmm. it was not one king. All of them saw that, oh, no, 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 <laughs> this man. It's not going to help people, us. No, no, this will happen. Mm. So, and then gave information. I'm sure they sent information to Accra, to voter to <laughs> Say, everywhere. Watch so guys. Those people who have always become, don't receive them. <laughs> uh, but before they could get to Accra or voter region, these yeah. people, the Elmina people had received uh, them there. Answer. And then we will say that they put up a magnificent structure there, which is the first European building outside Europe. The first European edifice outside Europe is the Elmina the Fort, Castle. Yeah. That is in George, mm -hmm. that huge mansion. There. And we are also told it is the first European building in the southern hemisphere of the world. So it's a very historic, a very classical building, which is left there for everybody to see. Since the 15th century? Yes. Yeah. So that was what happened. Now... When these white people or Europeans started working here, I told you they were studying us. Mm -hmm. So from the silent trade comes the physical direct contact. So what will happen? This time no more butter. The money economy would come in. The money economy mm -hmm. would come in. And then they discovered one thing, which is even in the Bible, it's in the Quran. It's everywhere. It's part of European history. We being neighbors, definitely, at one point in time or the other, we will be fighting. And then they discovered one thing with the African, that we believed in human sacrifice. So whenever there was war, let's say between the, I don't want to mention any ethnic Any of the ethnic groups. Yeah, mm -hmm. but between ethnic group A mm -hmm. and B, B, and then A, was able to defeat B, those who would be captured, they used them for menial words, and then whenever there was festival or a big king dies, then you sacrifice your head. So the people would come in to say that, no, we need those you capture in war, whereby they will be safe, they will be protected to be used somewhere. Not just needing them, needing them means giving them protection, no. We will buy from you. Mm. So it means that this time you are not destroying the person. The person you capture in war is of great value. So he becomes a piece of goods. You understand? Mm -hmm. So this led to massive wars on the African continent. In order to procure people for sale yes. to the Europeans. Very good. Mm. Because when you talk about trade, it is just a mechanism between buying and selling. Mm -hmm. And what is it? Based on a certain commodity. And for as long as the demand is there, there must be supply. So human beings, Africans became commodities. Commodities, yes. Because there was massive demand for slaves, goods. And then our people too were very ready to supply. Didn't they realize what they were doing to their societies? Initially, I would say they didn't realize. And that is where uh, we are very guilty. We found ourselves very, very guilty because it was not just selling vanquished tribes, but sometimes when you have plenty wives, I'm told, I read a piece of Aquamu history mm -hmm. where a man will marry plenty wives and then the ones who always make demands, 
demand for money, demand for this, demand. Then you arrange with the white men. So you travel with that wife to one of the forts, James Fort or Christian Buck, as if you wanted to do shopping for her. And then within the fort, you already make arrangement for her price. And then before she, she realizes, he had been grabbed oh, wow. and the husband is left. He's gone. Uh, sometimes your own child too, you know, far away from, let's say, Peki or Keta. He said, the boy is very rude and insubordinate. You know, you put some load on his head that we are going to this place. After today, mm -hmm. I beg you, go with me, okay? If you're able to lure him, you send him to the fort, present state, and that will be his end. Mm, they will ship him away. And then, in slavery, they didn't like people who were older. You know, they like young, virile men, women, who could work very hard and also produce yeah. more, children more children so that more they labor. would not need to very good to do labor and they wouldn't need to come here all the time. So back to your question, I believe that we were very wicked to our own extremely wicked. So if tribe A is selling tribe B to the Americas, you could see how wicked we were. And then selling our own children just because we felt that uh, they were not insensitive, they were very insensitive to our interests. Mm. And with that, Europe and America will develop because Europeans will come and buy human beings from here and send to the Americas which had just been discovered because I told you that uh, Christopher Columbus was on the trip that came to the Gold Coast. And look at the name they gave it, mm -hmm. Lamina, yeah. and the area is called what? Gold yeah. Coast, full of gold mm -hmm. everywhere. Gold everywhere. You know. So there was, they had discovered America, which was a new world, mm -hmm. you know, vast area of land. What would they do? They would start planting raw materials and then ship to Europe. You know, fruits and all the things you are talking Sugar, about, plenty of food, things, yeah. you know, it will get spoiled. Mm -hmm. So that gave them, there's this account proverb, Ohiyama Ajunjin. Once you have plenty food and plenty goods from America, we have to think of storage. So it made these people to relax and then begin to think of inventions. Mm -hmm. You understand? Because they've got money. They've got the farms. They've got continuous flow of cheap labor. Yeah. So let's use our minds, our acumen, to think of uh, scientific inventions. So in a short time, the Industrial Revolution started in the UK, and it spread to Germany, France, Russia, everywhere. So you will see that it is the same Americans. You know, it was the British people who went to found America, mm -hmm. and a few... French in uh, Canada. Canada, yeah. So basically, America is Europe, offshoot of Europe. Mm -hmm. So slaves from Africa, goods to Europe, and then the manuf uh, sorry, the raw materials to Europe, and then the finished products to Africa to foist the goods on us. Triangular trade. The triangular trade mm -hmm. to compel us to buy. Mm -hmm. So no matter what, you will have to buy. So that was how the African continent became a fertile ground for all European goods. And that enriched them a lot. Has anything changed? Unfortunately, not much. Mm. It has even got worse. Mm. So my brother, what happened was that they used the silent trade to steady us. They used the slave trade to make us very weak to make us very, very weak, to hate each other the more, so that when an Ewa man sees a phantom, I see him as an enemy, mm. because he will fight me and capture me and sell me, me to those people. So we became enemies to each other. Unlike previously, that we traded among ourselves, even if there was war, how long was this war? Mm. But now it became constant and continuous perpetual because warfare. perpetual because we had to satisfy somebody's whims and caprices. Mm. So the slave trade depleted the African continent until uh, this one, Louis Farrakhan, who says something. He says the Jews were just a handful of people living in Egypt. Nobody was harming them or disturbing them in any manner. With that, God said, oh, I have heard the cry 
of my people, Hebrews. So he sent Moses and Aaron to go and save them. In our case, 300 years of slavery, and we never had any Moses or Aaron to come and save us. And the dark continent became almost depleted until men of good conscience like Granville Sharp, William Wilberforce, and later Lord Mansfield, who gave that famous decision that slavery was not good and abhorrent to the very conscience of mankind. And then slave trade ended, 1807, thereabout. And then eventually the whole world thought of this abolishing slavery. No, the Europeans were not ready to let it go. Because it was a very lucrative Look at it, so they had to find yeah. another way, yeah. something new to replace slavery. I know for a fact that uh, um, French landowners, slave owners in Haiti were compensated when, when, when slavery was yeah. abolished. And, and you know, paid a lot Britain of money. took, mm -hmm. Britain, it took Britain more than 100 years for Barclays Bank and others to complete the payment mm -hmm. of reparations to those who set free their slaves. Mm -hmm. And the slaves never got even one penny. They, the slaves themselves they didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. But those the owners. who were asked to, to free them, to free them <clears throat> were rather given mm -hmm. money. And then uh, certain teams, football team, Liverpool and others, came up of slavery, mm -hmm. slave business, yeah. the rich people. Mm -hmm. Barclays Bank itself mm -hmm. was set up by uh, rich people, millionaires, who had made so much money from slavery and put their money together. Uh, the British warehouse, all of them, everybody was into slavery. So when the whole thing was abolished, especially by that famous decision by Lord Mansfield, they had to go around the law they met in Berlin. You know the famous Berlin, Berlin Conference. Conference yep. So you see, 1807, they abolished it. Mm -hmm. By 1837, it had become universally accepted that slavery was evil and then illegal. Then only a few years, 1884, Four. the Berlin Conference started mm. to partition Africa among the European powers, the partition of Africa. And we also call it in history the scramble for Africa after the slave trade had ended. Now they needed actual territories here. So you know that Togo, the Germans will go there. If it is France, they will go to Ivory Coast, mm -hmm. go here, all those things. So they cut it up like a, a cake, a wedding cake. And the sad thing mm -hmm. is that, my brother, philosophically, they decided that if you are cutting it up, do not give respect to ethnic identities, mm -hmm. but ensure that at all material times, the boundaries would affect tribes would be in their middle so that the one on the left, uh, the one on the right, and the one on the left would fight between themselves. Just like it's with the Nzema people, half of half it, in I, Ivory Coast, Coast, half in Ghana, with Basam, Asini, yes. the, and the Ever also, Ghana. Togo, just too uh, bad. The and then the Bono people, yes. the same. Yeah, the, the capital of the Bono ethnic group is mm -hmm. called Bono Manso. Mm -hmm. It's in Ivory Coast. <laughs> you understand? Then German. Mm. That fought Ashanti consistently yeah. and should have been part of us. It's also there. The Bagaris also. The same thing. Uh, and Bokina then the Moli Dabani mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. The Moses should have been part of exactly. the Dagomba, mm -hmm. uh, Mampusi mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And then they are there. Mm -hmm. And then go to the Volta region. It's even worse. Yeah. You go to Benin. Between Benin and Nigeria, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. That was what they did to us, so that to this day, there will always be that intertribal fight. Then it helps the big man at the top to be relaxed mm -hmm. and enjoy. So that was what happened. That made us to come under the white people. So the, the, the Berlin Conference of 1884 was just critical to Africa? Extremely crucial because that was the conference that prevented Europeans from fighting among themselves. But for the Berlin Conference, the, the First World War would have started earlier. Because everybody wanted to have a stake here. They were hungry for Africa. For, hungry for Africa. Mm -hmm. Everybody was having, ready to have a stake here. You see, the Ashanti Empire mm -hmm. fell in 1874, the Sagranti mm -hmm. War. Mm -hmm. 
the moment the empire fell, the French came in. You know, Baule, Baule and Yin, yes. and then Ethne Adet, then Zemas, yes. you know. The accounts were in Côte d'Ivoire. Côte d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. They were part of the Ashanti Empire. Mm -hmm. Immediately, when they saw that the Ashanti power over them had fallen, the French came in, made negotiations, and took them mm -hmm. away. So the British realized that they would lose every ethnic group that was serving Ashanti. And eventually, Ashanti too would be lured to go there. Because where you have taken my son, I also want to be. Of course. You understand. Mm -hmm. So the British knew that if they did not do anything about this situation, Ashanti itself eventually would go there. Ashanti would have been speaking French. By now, yes. <laughs> and if Ashanti goes, it means the other ethnic groups yeah. that Ashanti was controlling, the gone. Bono, yeah. the Achim, the uh, Aquapim, Aquamu, uh, and then Denchira, all of them would mm -hmm. have gone. Mm -hmm. So you see the story. Yeah. And that was why uh, a man like George Akem Ferguson becomes so relevant. You know, this man knew so many languages. He was a very young man. He knew several languages. A gold coaster. A gold coaster, a phantom man, mm -hmm. you know, from Salt Pond. Mm -hmm. This man knew several languages, and the British sent him as a surveyor over there, and then also as a negotiator to tell the chiefs in the north, and not only the north, he started working in Ashanti. At that time, Bono Afo, they were part of Ashanti. That's why he started working for. He saw that Brekum wanted to join the French, so he had to go and then negotiate. The Gonjas, he had to go and negotiate. And then Northern Vota region, no, today, OT. OT really. The man went to all those places to ensure that they would not be part of the German area. What was his assignment? He was surveying the land for the British. Surveying lands for the British. Mm -hmm. That was the primary assignment. Mm -hmm. And as much as possible, because he had efficient negotiating skills to be able to lure these people to come to our place and tell them why they should not join the mm -hmm. French that the English were very liberal people, mm. very religious people, mm. very kind people, very humane people, unlike the French who were using the direct rule system, the assimilation, the assimilation, you know, bullying people and enslaving people, the English were opposed. So by so doing, he claimed plenty land for the British. And it was in the course of this service that the slave raiders, Samori and Babatu, you know, killed him, the, his grave. Is still at a wa, mm -hmm. and that is why people who know me know that I always protest against Ghana naming an university at wa after C.K. Tedam, whose highest achievement in life was chairman of Council of Elders of the New Patriotic Party. You understand? You what think uh, Ekem Ferguson deserves oh, that honor more? He's a man of international stature. Mm. You understand? Mm. Ferguson did not hear from my village, Azim. No. I'm talking, we are building a country. We are not building a party. We are building a country. We are not building a tribe. You understand? So if Ekem Ferguson, who helped for what to become part of the Gold Coast, now Ghana, lies there and then somebody who became chairman of a political party's council of elders would have his name decorated and celebrated in fact if really we have ghosts this man will be turning in his grave so your argument is that george ekem ferguson could was a founder a founder of because Gothic the subject Ghana. is mm -hmm. we are talking about who founded, founded who founded ghana mm -hmm. so he's one of them yes mm -hmm. so we have mentioned nana kwamina mm -hmm. answer mm -hmm. and i have mentioned a person like george ekem mm -hmm. ferguson mm -hmm. yes but coming to where i left off so we now begin to have different countries mm -hmm. where they found plenty gold they will call it gold coast mm -hmm. where they found Plenty ivory or elephant, they will call it ivory coast. That's Cote you understand, mm -hmm. huh? Where they find the river Niger, everywhere it will be Niger. Mm -hmm. Or oh, where the Niger flows mm -hmm. into so many tribu uh, 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 what do you call it? tributaries mm -hmm. and distributaries, mm -hmm. then that will be a Niger area, mm -hmm. Nigeria, mm -hmm. River Senegal, and Gambia, Senegambia. There was Slave Coast too. 
And then slave coast along the Dahomey area, mm -hmm. plenty mm -hmm. slaves. Mm -hmm. So we call it slave coast. So that was how systematically yeah. we began having yeah. our names. And then identity. Then to cut a long story short, in the year 1896, here on the Gold Coast, the British brought the idea, the idea of the lands, Crown Lands Bill, to ensure that all the lands in the country not currently being used will be protected in the name of the Crown. Then the people at that time, you know, Wilson say, JW say, Mensa Saba, Hatton Mills, Kobina Sechi, J.E. Kisley, Hayford, you know, and then Hatton Mills, people like this. Sad back and say, no. Why do you call it Crown Lands and not Gold Coast Lands? Yeah. And because their education was very deep, they knew what had happened in South Africa. As soon as the Dutch got there, they pushed the black people far away to the very arid lands in South Africa and then uh, Rhodesia. The English did the same thing. So these people felt we had to protect our lands. So they founded what you call the uh, Aborigines Right, right Protection, Protection Society. Society. 4th August, 18, 1887. Yes. Mm -hmm. 97. 1897, I beg your Now, the significant thing about the Aborigines Right Protection Society, which many people have forgotten, is the fact that the Aborigines Right Protection Society, you see the word Aborigine, mm -hmm. eh? It stands for indigenous. Yeah, the natives. Natives. Mm -hmm. So the aim of ARPS was to fight for the upliftment and eventually the uh, uh, emancipation of all black people in the world. Not just Ghana alone. That was what I want everybody to know. Mm. That the people were interested in the affairs of black people in America, in the Caribbean in Togo, in Benin, everywhere. So they were Pan-Africanists. They were complete, that's the, the origin of Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. on our land. Mm -hmm. That was how it started. In the case of the Gold Coast, they sent a delegation immediately. And that delegation was financed by Wilson Say, who was a very rich man at that time. And he was a fancy man. Then a guy, a Dambe man, called A.J. Okansi, A.J. Okansi also contributed money to it. You understand? Mm -hmm. And then they left. And the argument they went to put up in the British Parliament, indeed, they intended addressing the British Parliament, mm -hmm. but the, 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 the Parliament did not allow them. What were they afraid of? Yeah, they were afraid of our ghosts, <laughs> you know. And they also wanted to see the king. It was not allowed mm. but at least the petition was left and then they accepted it ultimately and in this petition comes the definition of land by this brilliant African lawyer John Mensa Saba he said that the concept of land in Africa was completely different from their understanding of life, mm -hmm. uh, land. land. And then they asked him, what do you mean by that? And he said, in Africa, land is defined as that immovable property owned by the dead ancestors currently in the hands or in trust of the living for the benefit of those yet to be born. Mm an all-encompassing definition. Three. Yeah. So you see three entities here. Yes. The owner of the land is dead. Mm -hmm. And you, the living, it is in your hands as a trust. Trust means keep protecting yes. it. For those who are not born. For those who are yet to be born. Mm. That is immovable property. If we had this mentality with respect to the way we see land right now, I don't think Kalamse would be an issue. 
So sad. And even in Accra, out there, guard chiefs and family members, I mean, as if almost for free. So I believe it's a big public education you are doing for everybody. That if in 18, what is it? Uh, did I say 1897? You know, that's how what our people thought. And they spent their own money mm -hmm. to go and defend something. That, I mean, talk about uh, the man we mentioned, Kisli Hefon, mm -hmm. or Mesa Saba. I don't think he even owned an acre no. of land. Mm -hmm. But he was thinking about everybody, the yeah. entire continent. The dead, the living, and the Those who are yet to be born. born. Yeah. He was fighting for them. I wonder whether the students of Mesa Saba Hall in the University of Ghana even know the, the significance of the man for whom their hall has been named. Oh, but if the government, today's government, the Ghana government, knew the essence of what we are discussing today, whether it would have named a university after C.K. Tedham. That thing is really on your heart. I, I feel so sad <laughs> about that because if you wanted to name it after a northerner, then I believe it should have been somebody like Indewura Japa <laughs> who fought and got plenty land <laughs> For the people of Ghana, and it is now called the Savannah region. You understand? I mean, this country has never been short of great men. But if you can name an university after a party man, the next time when uh, another party is in power, then they also name an university or the airport or a harbor <laughs> after their party leaders. And then another, then who would be ready to die for the country? So your argument is that people like uh, Ekem Ferguson, are founders of Ghana, people like those who, were the, who, who started the APRS, the yes. Aborigines Rights Protection Society, are also rightly founders. The founders, mm. you understand. Mm. Then they worked very hard to the extent that everywhere in the British territory, Ghana, they were even settling cases. They took so many cases from court and they were settling them out of court until eventually they faced out. But many of the people who were then young would ultimately become part of the, uh, the 1917 one called the National Congress of British West Africa. Now you see that the Aborigines Right Protection Society was Pan-Africanist inclined. Mm -hmm. But this one shrank the idea. Listen, National Congress of British West Africa. They, they collapsed the idea. They made it smaller. Smaller. Mm. Now we are thinking about how British West Africa could form one federation. Could form one federation. What accounted for that uh, diminution of the vision? Because, you see, Sierra Leone, which had this famous university, Furabe, mm -hmm. is a very small country. And turning out so many graduates, they were not getting jobs over there. So many Sierra Leoneans we have to find jobs on the Gold Coast or Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Come to talk about Wallace Johnson and mm -hmm. others. They would come here. Akila Pasoya, mm -hmm. that family they came from Sierra yeah. Leone. Yeah. So they have to find jobs here. And because they were very well educated, highly intellectual, they were both natural leaders. But you can't be a natural leader on a land which is not yours. Mm -hmm. So when you have the idea that we are bringing together the entire West Africa, then you can have a constituency exactly. within which to operate. You can work anywhere. Uh -huh. It's like the European Union, where you, are, you have freedom of mobility to move, to work anywhere That's it. in the Union. Okay. You understand? So, so, that, so that was the vision. Vision, so mm -hmm. for all of us. So you see that uh, Namdi Azikwe and all others will have a place, all because it was for the entire British uh, West Africa. British West Africa. Mm -hmm. Then it went on until... Some of their leaders, like uh, Nanka, Bruce, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, latter leaders, mm -hmm. like Nanka, Bruce, and then Awuno Williams, would also begin to think about why not the Gold Coast mm -hmm. alone? Look at where Gambia is. Look at where Nigeria is. Look at where Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone is. So they began nurturing the idea of having our own. Then in 19... 47, this man, uh, uh, George Grant, Pa Grant, you know, who saw himself as about the richest African here. He was a trader. A trader. Mm. And was having problems with the white traders, you know, 
they were competing and evenly with the local people. Let me tell you, his driver was an Englishman from Liverpool. Background oh, driver. Yes, what, uh, Mr. Holly. I believe that he should be the first African to be chauffeured by a white man. So he said that ah, if a black man, my driver is a white man, why should the white man rule me and control my trade? So I believe I have to fight for independence. Mm -hmm. And that was why he invited J.B. Dankwa to second D. Mm -hmm. He was living in second D. That's why he had his headquarters. From Azim, his headquarters was in second Grant. D. Grant. Okay. But he was always attending legislative council meetings uh, in Accra. And that was where he met the Achimogwakwa representative. J.B. Dankwa. J.B. Dankwa. Mm -hmm. And then Ga representative Obechebi Lamte. Okay. So he called JB first to his office. And JB also met his colleague, R.S. Blay, a lawyer. And they all met and he gave them the idea of forming a party. And then there were other people in the party, but what happened was that JB's interest was with people from his household more. So you see that Nanka Bruce was from Sierra Leone, who mm -hmm. his parents were Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. so you wouldn't say he's Ewe or Ga or Fanti. But there was a Ewe man, Awuno Williams, Williams mm -hmm. R.S. Blay and Zima man, mm -hmm. and then this man, uh, Pa Grant and Zima mm -hmm. man, uh, Ubeche Bilamte, Ga man, then Akweje, Ga and uh, uh, Achim, mm -hmm. then the rest, always very, very close, as if knitted together. Dankwa, Pawili, Ekufuado. What was the relationship of, uh, between them? They were all blood relatives? Blood, see, uh, pa, this man, Pawili, mm -hmm. is a direct nephew to uh, J.B. Dankwa. Okay. And then the other one, Ekufuado from Akwapim. And you see, the Akwapim stool is a sister stool to the Achimabuako stool. Okay. The Akwapim one is for Rikuma. Mm -hmm. And then Achimabuakwa one is okay. so for repenning. Okay. So apart from this blood relationship, he was also his brother-in-law. Mm. So they were always closely knitted together. And then when the idea came, they found the party, founded the party. United you know, Gold Coast Convention. You, they brought, they scaled it down to the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. So you see that from Aborigines Rights Protection Society, that was Pan-African Pan -African. in nature, universal in nature, mm -hmm. came. Uh, National Congress of British West Africa, which was West, West Africa in nature. British territory. Now, United Gold Coast Convention. Mm -hmm. So you see where it started yeah. from. Narrowed. So they, they were very conscious of where they were coming from, uh, where they think they would succeed. And then the motto or the slogan, self government within the shortest possible time. Why? Because it was made up of Gold Coast merchants, lawyers, and then chiefs who were friends to the British. Very, they traded together. Mm. Many of them schooled together. And the very philosophy of colonialism was to decipher the brightest and the best of the Africans, give them education in the metropolis, the metropolitan country, if it is a French territory to France, to English territory to the France. UK. Mm. And then... When you come back, you will see that within the colonial system, you have your uh, classmates, and some of them even Freemasons together, joining this group to get odd fellows here and there together. Mm. So how dare you go in to snatch power from them? You only catapult yourself to their level, so that whilst your own folks will be fighting somewhere, you black man, you see that, you cross your leg like this, and Governor Gorgesberg was your classmate <laughs> or your friend. So you don't fear anything like again. Mm. So it's like the United Gold Coast Convention was just the extension of Governor Gorgesberg's idea of Africanization policy. Governor Gorgesberg said that you should push so many Africans into the civil service so that giving them about 100 or 200 years time, the British would face out and then black people, Africans would continue, begin to rule themselves. That was even a white man, who, that was his mentality. So he started uh, education at Chimota school and helping so many black people to go into the 
civil service so that eventually we govern ourselves. So this idea of Gorgisberg uh, was what was purchased by the leadership of the UGCC. Then August, 4th August, when the, the same August, yes. when UGCC was founded. August. So August, September, October, November, December, 10th December, they brought, they invited Kwame Nkrumah. Why did they do that? Because they needed a very versatile, mobile secretary. And many people in the leadership were big time academics, merchants or lawyers who could not spare their day to day lives for anything else. And Akweje remembered that, you see, sometimes God is, you can't leave God in whatever you are doing. Kwame Nkrumah had studied in the US, you know, he had studied in the US and felt that instead of coming to Ghana straight away, to the Gold Coast straight away, he might not have any job to support himself because he wanted to do full-time politics. So he decided to go to the UK to read law because it was their law we were operating here, not the US law, the common law to read law so that upon his return to the to his motherland he will be doing law part time to sustain himself mm -hmm. and then do politics, politics as well and he had failed the entrance exam the whole was the whole. yeah he failed the entrance exam that's why i'm talking about providence mm. the role of god mm. in modern human beings mm. you know i believe he wouldn't understand why he failed you know, sometimes you go to school, you fail the whole level, you get third class, you, do, you don't understand. Later on in your, in your life, you understand why it was good for you even to, to have failed. Mm -hmm. At least, it, it, the first thing is that it makes you humble. You see that you are not master over everything. That, mm -hmm. that humility, humility. humility can carve a niche for you somewhere mm -hmm. else. So Nkrumah had failed in that examination and rather decided to concentrate on his PhD thesis. Then Akwaje told these people that that man hasn't got any profession that will tie him down when he comes to Ghana. So let's go and bring him. Mm. And as for mobilization, he's number one. So he, they brought in Kwame Nkrumah. So they must have heard about what he was doing. He says, plus, yes, mm. because he was always doing mobilization. Don't forget, he was one of those who were the brains behind the 1945 Manchester All African People's Congress. Yes, yeah. Yes, so they knew him, they had heard about him. Mm. And in the student days, Nkrumah loved wearing glasses. Mm. So they said they bespectacled Kwame Nkrumah. You know, he was always wearing glasses, mm. but he didn't have any defense. Mm. It was when he was coming that he threw that thing <laughs> away. Yeah, and people make the mistake of saying that it was J.B. Danquist's money that brought, transported Nkrumah to Ghana. Please, J.B. Danquist was just a practicing lawyer. Who brought him? Who the paid for bank his passage? roller mm -hmm. was definitely oh, George yeah. Grant. Mm -hmm. George Alfred Grant. Mm -hmm. He brought him and he stayed in George Alfred Grant's house in Second D. Poissy Road mm -hmm. a couple of days before they drove him to South Pond to commence his work mm -hmm. at the headquarters of the UGCC. And when he came, this man discovered that there were 13 branches, very inactive branches. So there was nothing you could call a party, you know, just the name. So he drew up a master plan and presented it to the UGCC leadership. And they told him that they would not be prepared to support that. Do you know why they would not be prepared to support that? Because Nkrumah had earmarked places from Accra to Kulungugu, which included Volta region, Ashanti, not everywhere. And they said that, no, the one thing we are doing is it's there. A, it's a Gold Coast yes, affair. it's a Gold Coast. Yeah, limited affair. to the yes. Gold Coast. And you see, the leadership that we mentioned, if we are to go back, George Alfred Grant was the chairman or president, first vice or first uh, chairman, vice chairman, or vice president, was R.S. Blay. And then the second was Pa Grant. So the mistake people made by saying that J.B. Danko founded UGCC is not true. Mm -hmm. 
even in U, uh, uh, within UGCC, he was the third in command, not the first or second. Mm. First was Grant, uh, the second RS Blay, the third, uh, the man you mentioned, uh, uh, JB Dankwa. You understand? Then we had Awuno Williams, we had Nanka, Bruce, then we had uh, Obe Kwame Nkrumah, who Obe became General Secretary, Obeche Bilamte, uh, Pawili William, uh, uh, William Oforiata, then Edward Ekufo Ado. So this was the UGCC. So you will see that this UGCC leadership is strictly made up of people from the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean by the Gold Coast? In those days, the Gold Coast was made up of Western province. The Western province is today Western and Central regions. Okay. And now Western region has been broken into two. Mm -hmm. Then the Eastern province was, what do you call it? Greater Accra and the Eastern region. region. Mm -hmm. You understand. Mm -hmm. So that was the Gold Coast they were comfortable with. Ashanti wasn't in it. Ashanti was a protectorate. Yes. Transvolta, the same. Northern, Northern territories, the okay. same. So this, so in modern day, day Ghana, this would be Western, Central, Greater Accra, Eastern. That was the Gold Coast. That was the Gold Coast. Mm. And that was what they had in mind. You know, the other part, which is today part of Ghana, was not within their thinking or bothering, nothing. That was why they did not bring in Ashanti leaders. Because at that time, Vito Usu was a thriving Ashanti lawyer. Uh, what do you call Buzia was a famous Ashanti academic. Wrong, academic. But they were not interested. Mm -hmm. They were not interested. Mm -hmm. So let them come to think about people who came to hate Nkroma, like Arara and Ponsa Bafo, Akoto, uh, Buzia himself. Where would you have been in terms of politics but for Kwame Nkroma, who drew a program embracing the whole nation? So when they rejected that program, what happened? When they rejected that program, uh, it was this is a very good question. When they rejected mm -hmm. that program, Nkrumah told them that the, uh, I, he so desperately needed every part of the country such that even if you won't pay me, I can go about doing the work without any money. Pro bono. Pro bono, I would do that. Mm -hmm. Because we need all of them in order that we will form the entity called Ghana. And the reason why Nkrumah will say that is that... You see, the people he was working with had had all their training in the UK, which is a very small island. And it was a world of its own. Mm -hmm. Kwame Nkrumah had his training in the United States of America, yes. a continent Bas. called the country. Mm -hmm. You Bas. understand? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So the Ghana or the Gold Coast he came to meet, for him, was less than one state in the US. Mm -hmm. And you want to call this a country. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Need the numbers. Numbers. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that also influenced Nkrumah's idea. You know, Nkrumah was a lecturer in African studies, mm -hmm. you know, black history in Europe. And through that, he had learned about this scramble for Africa, which these people would not bother about. He felt that it was a scramble for Africa that partitioned Africa, the Berlin Conference that partitioned Africa. So any good politician should be able to do something that would undo what the Berlin Conference had done. Mm -hmm. So this man, you think he had a small head, it was just too big for anybody to conceptualize. You know, when they were thinking about, Pat Grant was thinking about his business interests, uh, J.B. Dunk were thinking about his law practice, name them, this Kwame Nkrumah, was thinking about a continent. I think he was okay. reversing what had been the diminution because you started from the, the APRS, which was huge, Pan-African, then he came down to the British West you. Africa, and then down to Gold Coast, and then Nkrumah is reversing the progress. Uh, so those who are mathematicians, I believe they will know how to draw yeah, they not the, 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 the sketches. Now we are going back up. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that was the idea. So of, what the UGCC's, UGCC's um, what, what were the achievements? The UGCC, yes. the achievement of the UGCC. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A great achievement. Mm -hmm. The fact that they were able to form the first political entity that dreamed about independence. Mm. Because they said self-government within the shortest sure, No matter how long it would have taken it, it was still different from National Congress of Britain, West Africa, mm -hmm. or uh, Aborigines' mm -hmm. reputation. It was the real uh, idea 
of getting independence for us. And don't worry much about that. The, uh, uh, the vision of the pioneers was a bit, a bit narrow, mm. but at least it was a great achievement. Then would, you call them, would you call them as founders as well? Would you list them as founders? I would list them as founders. Mm -hmm. I would never leave them, but they were proto-nationalists. The, How do you mean? Uh, that is, they were not that radical. Mm -hmm. They were not that radical. No, okay. they were not that radical. So I would not take them off people like those who belong to NCBWA and, and ARPS. Yes. They were about the same. Okay. But it, uh, what made them Kroma different from them was the fact that he didn't study all in all in the UK. Mm. You understand? So it means when Nkroma arrived on the Gold Coast, he didn't have classmates among the colonial system. Mm. Two, Kwame Nkrumah studied in a former colony, that is United States USA. of America. Yeah. Yeah. Three, Nkrumah studied together with black people, a lot of black people, and he didn't attend the famous university. He attended a predominantly black university, Lincoln University. So his outlook was completely different. Completely different, mm. black, 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 mm. black, black, mm. to the extent that it made him to naturally hate white people. Mm -hmm. And then those uh, black people he met over there, you know, introduced him to socialism. Where being a socialist or a communist, you always felt that the man on the top is an enemy mm. to the masses down. Mm. So when Nkrumah came down here, his perception of issues was completely different from everybody he came to meet. No classmate here, apart from people like Bedema and others who attended Achimota with him. So it also influenced him. So the classmates he would think about were those who attended secondary school mm. with him in Ghana. So he called them to himself, and they were people from different ethnic groups. And then also, because he started setting up offices across the country. Against the wishes of the UGC. UGC, it means that those who would cluster to him would be people of national dimension. Mm. You get Bedema from Volta mm -hmm. region, you get Mahama from the north, you get Krobodis from Mahama's father, father, all of them, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Initially, he was with the NPP people, mm -hmm. then the time came, not in people's party, they saw him and they quickly mm -hmm. left and came to him. Krobodis from Ashanti, mm -hmm. at that time, this man, uh, 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 Vito Usu, mm -hmm. they belong to the Ashanti, whatever, Ashanti Youth Association. So when they saw that this man who has arrived, is thinking of a country for mm -hmm. all of us, mm -hmm. and not only the southerners, immediately mm -hmm. decided that they would be part of him. So later, within a very short period of time, Kwame Nkrumah had become an institution rather than an individual. Mm -hmm. And he became a man of many parts that when you see Nkrumah, you see people from everywhere. You understand? That was a master stroke, bringing in other people from the area apart from just the the coast the, the so-called yes, gold yes, coast yes. you understand mm -hmm. so it made him an institution instantly that let me also say that when the Nkrumah arrived he made friends with this man Niko Abinaboni the, 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 the famous Usuala Tamanche mm -hmm. you know because he said that when he came here there was nothing political and for Nkrumah Everything political means violence mm -hmm. because he felt that the land did not belong to them. So if you are driving away somebody who is a foreigner who has taken your land, it's not a matter of negotiations mm -hmm. and it's not a matter of soft talk. No, you have to use violence mm -hmm. to push away the man. And that was why uh, Ni Kwabina Boni, who was a very famous uh, Gold Coast uh, merchant and then a famous chief who had worked in the cocoa industry traveled to almost every part of the country, and the chiefs knew him very well. Nkrumah identified him. And so they planned the so-called Gokos Bokot of European goods. It was planned towards the end of, towards the end of the year 1947 to the beginning of the year 19. 48. Nkrumah hit the ground running. I mean, he came, he came to Ghana in, in, in Gokos in 
on the 10th Dece of, of December, December 47. Yeah. And by January, the, February. And, and, and the, he was yes, already yes, organizing this. Yes, he didn't the, waste much time. Three months, yeah, the organizing. He didn't waste time. Yes. So whenever you mention the name, Nikwa Brambo, the mm. name should come. Mm. He was always, and he didn't want to come up much because he was working under other people. He mm. was the general secretary mm. of a, a party. He was not the leader. And then you could see that outside the leadership where was where he had his support mm. and his understanding, you know. And you see, Nick Kwabena Boni was such a, a brilliant person. Why? Kwabena Boni made Nkrumah to be aware that if you want to succeed, please don't follow the educated people you have come to meet, mm -hmm. but the ordinary people in the streets. Are those the veranda boys? Later we'll come to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Ordinary people. Mm -hmm. So the ordinary folk. The very, very ordinary people, they will help you. Mm -hmm. So they identify the ordinary people. They are the common people who go to shops and buy. The rich people, they'll go to shop once and maybe a month, they won't go there. Or even they'll go directly to buy from wholesale. Mm -hmm. So when Kwabina Boni was able to organize the Ghanaian masses not to buy European goods, or the shops were closed down completely, looting European shops here and there, and it succeeded. And then they met a king. The thing is coming to an end. You can't tell the people that perpetually they shouldn't buy European goods. Mm -hmm. Eventually they need the That's goods. Mm -hmm. So what will you do? Then Nkrumah and his friend Akwaje identified another potent force. What is it? The Second World War had ended and the Gold Coasters or Ghanaians who were sent to the war mm -hmm. to fight had been brought home and demobilized. Some wounded, many of them, you see, 1939 to 45. Five. So having stayed away so many years, you won't come and find your wife the same. Mm -hmm. Your daughter, the same. This daughter you were taking care of. By the time you came, somebody had been pregnant. Yeah, pregnant. Changed, yeah. If I had been here, this thing wouldn't have happened. And then somebody had married your wife because he thought, she thought you were going to die. <laughs> you know, or the wife is waiting for you, but he has got two children in your absence. See, these people have had their family life completely broken down, highly traumatized. And every evening they will converge along the beach, Jamestown and drink and remember their stories wartime, you know, and then weep mm -hmm. and how their lives have been useless. You come and your own people are driving you from the homes because they thought you went to the white man's land and you brought money. Now you brought wounds. <laughs> you didn't bring anything apart from a military uniform. Then Nkrumah, who had studied socialism, backed by his friend Ni Kwabina Bonnet, and then the famous lawyer, uh, what do you call it, Ajay, Akwajay. Akwajay, decided to take advantage of the situation. So without anybody having sent them, Nkrumah and Akwajay went and organized the ex-service men and told them that we came from the UK and we know how much has been given to soldiers like you? You mm. fought alongside the white yeah, sure. So why should he get an estate and then what Ghanaians now called as Gracia? And then you look at your plight. And so on this day, they make the day 28 February 1948. You are going to the Castle Christian Book. Present a petition to the governor. And then they will pay you. They will say, would they pay? say, yes, this is coming from the UGCC. It's coming from the UGCC. And we are told that Nkrumah wrote it in his hand, which many people don't know. Nkrumah wrote it in his hand. The petition. The petition. And it was uh, Ajay Akwajay who was dictating the West. Mm. Do you know why? He was a lawyer. Ah. So put it in the, in the right language. Yes, yeah. and then Nkrumah would do the right. scribe yeah. Yeah. work. Mm. So they did it and gave it to, handed it over to the ex-service men. And then they ran away. So they were actually the architects behind they it. They were the architects. Okay. 
And the woman knew that. And they said, make sure you don't put it to anybody's hand. Look, when you reach the crossroad, the security man will stop you and say that whatever petition you give it to us, we'll send it to the governor. Don't agree. Say you want to see the governor mm -hmm. yourself. You know, what they didn't know was that Nkoma had just plotted violence that there will be bloodshed and that bloodshed would reverberate everywhere and that will usher us into the liberty we were seeking. Wasn't that a cold-hearted, callous strategy by... Yes, when God, God wanted to save the world, he brought his only begotten son to be killed. killed. You understand? We are told that when Kofanochi wanted the Ashantis to get their freedom from danger, a certain chief, you understand, was killed. So some violence is allowed for liberation. Oh, Masa. There has to be, whatever you are doing, you should be very dedicated to mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. cause. Mm -hmm. And Nkrumah felt that until blood has been spilled, there will never be liberation or salvation. So that was what happened. So when the people pressed on and they got to the uh, 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 Osu crossroads, then that Sergeant Emery came up and then stopped them. They realized what Nkrumah had told them, that the man said, Yen tio bia, me and tio bia. Don't listen we to anybody. Go mm -hmm. So they moved on, that they wanted to hit the casting grounds. He said, nobody will permit you. It means you are going to overthrow the government mm -hmm. of the day. So definitely there will be fireworks. And they killed some of our people. Nkoma and Nikwabna Boni and Akwaje had already spoken to the organized labor at that time, roughly called TUC. You know, the mine workers union, the railway workers union. He had already alerted them. So the moment it hit, people got around that, they have killed some gold coasters. This is why people have killed them. The strike started mm. from every part of the country. So they were surprised that, ah, why should this thing happen on the Gold Coast? It was carefully coordinated. Carefully coordinated by somebody. Mm. And because it was in the General Secretary's hand, they knew that it was the UGCC. So they started rounding them up. And uh, Nankan Bruce was not immediately available. R.S. Blay was not available. Pa Grant was not available. And those who were in Accra, around Accra, immediately they got them. And they were, of course, Kwame Nkrumah, Akwaje, and then uh, J.B. Dankwa, Obechebi Lamte, uh, it were the Kufuado, and then William Ufuriata. The six gentlemen on our currency. So the six gentlemen. So that is so the reason why The following why we have day, mm -hmm. the newspapers captured the story, Big Six arrested. Big Six arrested. So it's a media creation? Media creation because they were not the Big Six leaders of the UGCC because mm -hmm. we started from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that somewhere told us that the leader of the UGCC was Pagrant, Grant. who was still alive mm -hmm. at that time because he died in 1956. So if he had been around for that arrest, you'd have been added would to have this. Been, it, it could have added. been Big Seven. Or you understand? And then Auno Williams too. And then Nanka Bruce too. It could have been Big Nine. Yeah, so the handful who were got and then apprehended, yeah, said Big says arrested. Mm. And then when they went to the police station to write their statement, all of them, including Akweje, denied knowledge of what had taken place. Akweje planned this thing with Kwan Kuma. Yes, because it was not his handwriting. It mm. was easier for him to say... I don't know anything. The lawyer anything. escaped. Yeah, they were, and that's what most lawyers do. Their clients will be incarcerated <laughs> in prison, and they will pick their files, their dockets, and then leave. And if they will pay their fee, then they go and enjoy the fee. Ah, they go and enjoy it. So that was what happened that day. Somebody died, you know, somebody was arrested. Others uh, said that, no, uh, we don't know anything about, about it. it. So after this scenario, you know, they set up the Kusi constitutional committee mm -hmm. they set it up to investigate the disturbances and the violence that had occurred on the gold coast could you believe that on this kusi committee the members were rather uh, the other four people and all other people on the gold coast minus akwaje and kwame nkrumah the other the so-called big six they they found 
places on the on committee, the... committee settings to draw up a new constitution for the country. These people were part of it. And Kwame Nkrumah and then Akwaja Akwaja, they identified that you, you were part of the action. Oh, okay. So they wow. threw him away and he had to be forced to come back to his friend Kwame Nkrumah. But let's talk about, that was 1948. So when Nkrumah saw this hatred going on, he was still the general secretary because UG, uh, CPP wasn't founded in 1948. No, so he was still with them when he came back from uh, prison in the north. He was with them. And don't forget, you see the smoke he used to take independence for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. When they released him, he was wearing a white shirt which was completely soiled. And the northern chief called him. They drove to his cottage and then gave him something better to wear. Yes. So that was where it was a souvenir for him. Mm. He kept. And then on Independence Day, he, he exhibited. Oh, nice. Now, back home in Salt Pond, they held a big meeting after everybody had been released that you, Kwame Nkrumah, we are ready to pay you to transport you back to the UK and then to enable you complete your PhD thesis. Choose between that one and a demotion from general secretary to treasurer of the party. And we are told that Nkrumah said, told all his friends, you understand, like Bedema and Botuana, who had also become his own scribes. No, he was ascribed to the UGCC leadership, and he also had these scribes behind him, that he felt that instead of abandoning them to go back, let him accept the treasurer position so that he continue to be in the country, continue to be in the party, and eventually he will know what to do. And at that time, so you see, the founders of this country, there was a man called Mr. Pobibaini, Pobibaini from Second D. And then, Otumfuo Se Ose Ajiman Prempe, the second, had already had a word with Kwame Nkrumah. You think tribalism doesn't work? Tribalism works. So he, called, he had called Kwame Nkrumah to his palace and told him that these Achim people you are following, they are no good people. You know, the Ashanti Empire, mm -hmm. this. We root almost everybody in Ghana. Now, as I'm saying, I'm sitting here, and then one of these people will come and rule me, especially uh, an Achim man. Why an Achim man? Because at that time, this man had became a, he become a judge, R.S. Blay. Mm -hmm. And then this man, too, Park Grant, was a very old man and not very well educated. So I swear on J.B. Dankwa, who had so many family members in the party, so if anything, he will be the person to be elected as their leader. And that's something they had got to know that he would not want any gold coaster to come and become the leader of the new Ghana Nkrumah was building. And then two, you, where you come from, the Nzema people, many, many years ago, we were war allies. That's why they call you Nzema Kotoko. And we are Asante Kotoko. So I am giving you my own Ashanti Youth Association, led by Aran and Ponsa Vito Wusu and Krobo Ebisei, and then Jantua, F.A. Jantua, and then, yes, Franklin Adubobi, mm -hmm. Jantua, and then KSP, Kwame Sanapoku, Jantua, to follow you. So go and break away, don't join them. And these people had followed Nkrumah to Salt Pond. So when Nkrumah told them that they had called him up there, he was climbing up, and he had taken his decision. And down there, they were making noise. And then somebody among the big people said, who is that foolish Valanda boy making noise over there? You understand? From among the UGCC leadership up on the story building, and then the, uh, the common people who had surrounded, uh, somebody was making a shouting over his voice. I believe he said, Kwame Koma, want to me yanu she, want to me yanu she. You can't do him anything. Uh -huh. And then, so bro, who is that veranda boy? And they said that the Nkrumah adopted the name. Mm -hmm. I remember a very elderly gun man also told me that Nkrumah had earlier adopted the name veranda boy. 
because when he came, he was lodging with Akwaje, who was already married. Mm -hmm. And he, Nkrumah, was not married. So, and the house was not big. So Nkrumah said, me, I would accept to sleep on the veranda. veranda. And these people were sleeping. And then they started calling him Veranda Boy. So whatever it was, it was a CPP uh, 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 appellation. Mm -hmm. It became part of the CPP people that they were Veranda Boy. Boys. Now, the Ashanti group, it was actually the Ashanti group that told Nkrumah that, look, you are going up there to resign, whether you like it or not. Mm. You won't go outside the country. You won't become a treasurer. You are going to resign. resign. And somebody, an elderly person, told me that he still remember, remembers the words of Jantua. In Tiwo, who quack or resign? If I say, who quack or treasurer? No. Who quack or treasurer? No. Are you going to accept the treasurer? The treasurer's position. position. Mm -hmm. And then instantly, somebody was sent to go and buy writing pad. You know writing pad. Mm -hmm. Because you are I'm old, an old school guy. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the veranda boys will have to bend this way. And then Nkrumah was made to write a letter. They stood on him, as our language would put it. They stood mm -hmm. on him. Mm -hmm. Write it that you have resigned. So he used his back as a writing desk. Writing desk. Uh -huh. So as he was climbing up there going, the leadership of the UGCC knew he was either going to be transported back to where he came from or to be a treasurer. And then he knew he was going to resign. So when he got there, he gave them the letter. And then they got angry because they discovered that that was not what they wanted. Yeah. So immediately they told him, now you have been sacked. Well, they wanted the records in their own yeah. books to read that he had been. Yeah. Uh, but that wasn't valid because if you you put your letter there as a resignation, you can't sack me. I've already resigned. He said, mm -hmm. I've resigned. This yes, letter, letter shows up. Exactly. And then to in their minutes, oh, they, also... they said, today we have sacked you from the okay. party. Mm -hmm. So he came back and then went, left uh, uh, Salt Pond, went back to Takwa, where he met a sizable number of people. And then they decided to form a political party. And then he told them with the ideas he brought that may, not many of our people are educated. So if you have a long name like UGCC, not many people can pronounce it. Mm -hmm. So it should be short. Mm -hmm. So talking about it, he said they shouldn't also depart from the word convention. Because those days, because our people are always religious, they say every year the religious, religious people. We have convention, convention. Easter, Easter convention. This convention, yeah, convention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this political convention too was given that we should not mm. depart from that. So they didn't depart from the word convention. And it was easier for everybody to pronounce convention yes. because church people, convention, convention, convention. 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 Mm. So it became convention people's party. party, CPP, which everybody could pronounce. Mm. Self government now. Yeah. So which is easier for everybody as GN. It was a remix of self-government within the shortest possible yeah, time. Because they were kicking okay. against okay. that one. They were rebelling and revolting mm -hmm. against that one. So they had the CPP. Mm -hmm. Now, when they had the CPP, you see, the following year, they found the CPP eh, in 1949. You see, Nkrumah still felt that it's only violence that will save the country. So don't forget, we started from the 1947 Bokot, then 1948 Riots. Riots. Yeah. Then 1950 Positive Action. So you see the idea of Nkrumah. That nobody should go to work. Nobody should go to work. All civil servants should stay at work. And he had a newspaper that circulated everywhere called the People's Evening mm. News. So the date that he put, everybody accepted it. And then there was a general sit-down strike in the country. And what happened? It was Nkrumah and his CPP leaders who had organized this. Nkrumah asked destiny will have it. I've mentioned one advantage he had. Because he didn't have any profession, mm -hmm. that was why he was able to do mobilization. And without money, because the chiefs and ordinary people were inviting him to their homes to eat. So he never had money in his pocket, but he was also never hungry because everybody was feeding him wherever he went. They were feeding him, giving him clothes everywhere. So you see that if he had passed the law entrance examination, upon returning from the UK, he would have been 
just like JB down quite and others, and that would have been the okay. end of him. And that if we said we wouldn't have had our independence. So sometimes misfortune is a fortune. It's a bit indeed. And so if you fast forward to 1957, before 1957, where we are was still called Gold Coast, wasn't it? Gold Coast. So it means that mm -hmm. now CPP has branches everywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. So UGCC was also forced to have branches mm -hmm. everywhere mm -hmm. in the country. But then CPP had already taken over the entire country. What was the status of the Northern Territories, the Ashanti Protectorate, and the Transvaal Togo land? Were they part of Gold Coast by, by that time? Part of the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. The UGCC was able to campaign in the North, mm -hmm. telling them that you, you Northern people, the white man drew this imaginary boundary between the North and the South. So no, as at the time, in the 1940s, no school in the North, no school in the North, because the white people were smart that when they introduced school education in the South among the fancy people, they started producing lawyers mm. and people who started giving them problems. Challenging them. <laughs> that was one of the reasons why they quickly moved the capital from Cape Coast to Accra, where, where the, they will have their peace of mind. Fewer lawyers also. Yes. <laughs> and also they skimmed the whole coast and realized that uh, they will have peace in Accra, even though the terrain was very bad. <laughs> but going to the everywhere to, to the far east will not help them. To the far west, people were well educated. It will not help them. So they settled, settled at the center in Accra. And no schools in the north. So UGCC campaigned that you should rather put up a strong case that you want your own country. Because if you assist the whole country to become independent, you appointment of ministers, directors, I mean, big, big, big appointment, you will not fit in. Because you're not educated? You are not educated. And you will serve your own black man. So it will have been better we all continue serving the white man rather than he living and you serving the southerner. Mm -hmm. So immediately the people understood and they formed the Northern People's Party, Dumbo. Mm -hmm. They formed their own party, agitating that they either formed their own party or they, they should allow them uh, to uh, uh, create a federalism so that there will be a different set of people mm -hmm. or they should leave them to form their own country. Then they campaigned the same way in Transvota Togo, S.G. Anto. Because at that time, because of the end of the Second World War, these people were still part of Ghana. But uh, uh, the UN, after the First World War, uh, it was not the, the League of Nations has stated that these people should be made to be on their own or to join their brothers. But the British realized, and the cover results said that the people in that region were very hard working, that they should not be allowed to leave. And it was a special advice even given to Nkrumah that he should not allow the people of Transvolta to go land to leave. They were very hard working. They could work in the army, in the police, and as very good civil servants more than the rest. So they shouldn't allow them to go. Mm -hmm. You understand? But S.G. Anto and his people also wanted a space for his own. And so the UGCC people would campaign there. So it means that they were able to get people of like minds to work against the, uh, what do you call it, the convention people. What was the strategy for Ashanti? The, yeah. the strategy for Ashanti. Mm -hmm. They told the Ashanti Hindi that before your empire fell, you were ruling all these people, everybody among the Akans. When the white man goes, other people are going to rule you. But when you have your own country, or at least a federal system of government, you control your money, your wealth, your people, everything. And that's Antehini bought into that. What was, and what was Kwan Krumah's uh, counter-argument? And Krumah's counter-argument was centralism. Mm -hmm. For all of us should form one country. Mm -hmm. And the moment you think about federalism, the wealth of that region will go to that region. But don't forget that this region where your wealth is not going, maybe they have better manpower resource than you. Or the, where you think, take it this way, you have cocoa. And at that time, Ashanti and Brown were one region. And they were the leading uh, producer region of cocoa. 
But in Chroma, you can put in the argument that uh, the Kosovo Dam, you know, before independence, mm -hmm. the dam, the, 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 the plan was already there. If the plan, the map is built, it's not in your region. No. It's in somebody's region. And the harbors are even in different regions. Different How regions. How do you export your cocoa? And then bauxite and then manganese, mm -hmm. and those, they are not mm -hmm. in your region. So for us to call, to be called a country, for us to enjoy, there must be one central society. So that was Nkrumah's idea. And then, of course, we have to get to Independence Day, 6th March, 1957. What were the arguments that way went into the naming of the country Ghana right now? Who took that decision? Before you go to 1957, let me say something. Because we are talking about founders. Yes, who founded Ghana? You see, K.A. Bedema. K.A. Bedema. The colonial government met Bedema. Mm -hmm. Because I told you he was lucky Bedema didn't go to jail with him. They met him and told him that, that's your man. So it was violent here and there. So we want him to rot in jail. We want to give you money and all the resources you need. This is Bedema's last interview before he died. Mm. He said, so you will go everywhere, campaign for yourself, and you become the leader of the CPP. Mm -hmm. And that man, let's all forget him. He's bringing Eastern ideas here and there. He's not a good man. So what the man says, when they gave him the money and the vehicles, vans, and other resources, that was where he realized how influential Nkrumah was and the extent to which the colonial government feared Kwame Nkrumah. You see his idea. Mm. You know, look at how he interpreted it. When they gave him the leadership on silver platter, he rather felt he had to continue to be obedient, loyal, loyal to his boss. And he said he gave it a different interpretation altogether that if you can come to me and then you see that I should go and do this, it means you know that I can do it. And at the same time, if you say Nkrumah should rot in jail, it means you You're fear. So, Bedema said he took all the resources and that gingered him to campaign more. And he realized that most part of Ghana followed their chiefs and the chiefs were aligning with the UGCC, the Matimoho people. So, to be on the safer side, he looked at where Accra, I mean, in Accra, where in Kuma, the sea people was most popular. So, he made one man, Nali Nylander, Ladid Nylander, who was a CPP candidate for Accra Central, Bedema persuaded him to step aside so that Nkrumah would stand. And at that time, the constitution did not bar prisoners from contesting. So you see the wisdom of K. Bedema. Mm -hmm. He didn't go to university, he ended at Achimota. But look at his wisdom that there is only one thing that will bring Nkrumah back from prison when the people have elected him as their leader. Because, of course, he represents the people. Reza and then the 1951 election, Nkrumah won over So Benema, Benema, how did he switch? The, 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 because you have to know who is on the ballot. How, uh, he disagreed mm -hmm. and then put Nkrumah's picture. They were communicating. They were mm -hmm. going to prison mm -hmm. to communicate with him. So they told him what he done. He signed everything. They were, what do you call it, smuggling papers to him. He signed that mm -hmm. he was the candidate, mm -hmm. which history says he was. And then he won Accra Central. Is, over is that what is now we call? Oh, the, 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 that is the, sec, the, the, the constituency that yes. Nkrumah won. Yes. In prison. That was Nkrumah's own constituency. Mm. So when he came, you know, he developed that place more. Mm -hmm. His own constituency. So you see, the general post office headquarters, yes, the GNTC headquarters, yes. was there, and then APSA, but now APSA. Yeah, all those banks. All those, yes, yes, yeah, that was his that constituency. Okay. So he, he was very sensitive to the area. Second, but for them, he would have been nobody. The Kingstown, people of or the, 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 yes, house everywhere. He would have been nobody. Mm. They made him who he was. And then his friend Bedema too. So he came out of prison? He came as, as leader of government businesses. Mm -hmm. 1951. Then 1952, he became prime minister. You understand? Then uh, the British people wanted to prolong their stay here. They said that the 1951 election showed various ethnic groups metaphorizing uh, into political parties. Mm -hmm. So we want parties that are not tribally based. Mm. So broad based. Broad based. Mm. So there will be another election. So that was why 
the, the National Liberation Movement, Transvota, all this MP, New uh, Northern People's Party, they came together and formed what you call the United Party UP. to challenge the Convention People's Party. Party. So, if we are talking about traditions, United Party was a tradition made up of the the Ewe based Transvota Togoland mm -hmm. Party, mm -hmm. led by S.G. Anto, Anto, the Northern People's Party, uh, the man Dumbo. Dumbo. Uh, uh, the Northern People's Party, was led, led by Dumbo. By Dumbo. Mm -hmm. And then the National Liberation Movement, led by Bafua Akoto. How about the guns? Did the guns also have a. Gans Shifi Mokwei. Okay. Because they said they, everybody is taking their mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. So in the end, they all metamorphosed into one party against the CPP. But UP. many of their leaders had left to join the CPP. Mm. At every side you could see had left to join the uh, Convention People's Party. So there was a need for uh, uh, more elections. There was a, after 51, there was a 54. Mm -hmm. And still they wanted to test whether Nkrumah was actually popular. Just to delay us. Mm -hmm. And then 56 one which gave us the independence. Uh -huh. So tra traveling to this level, and then at the, on the day we were taking the independence, watch the days, it was only CPP leaders that declared independence. Mm -hmm. Because we know that the leader of the opposition, Buzia, you know, had studied in Oxford and he liked the white people, the British people, he didn't want them to go. And there was an article he wrote, are you leaving us so soon? Which Ghanaians know that he felt independence should not have been rushed. And as he is in his grave, he still thinks that we shouldn't have rushed to get our independence. How do you know that? Ah, but he was a, 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 a British minded. <laughs> and then come to talk about J.B. Danka. He became politically insignificant when Buzia came up. The reason why they put Buzia there was that Buzia was already a professor. And then Anto was a teacher. And then uh, 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 Dumbo. Dumbo to a trained teacher. Mm -hmm. So because of superior education, they put uh, Buzia there as their leader. But with the coming up of Buzia, and where I started telling you about tribalism, you see, Bono and Asante were one, were one region. Mm -hmm. So Buzia was seen as an Ashanti man. Mm -hmm. So the Asante Hini would prefer Buzia to JB Dankwa. You understand? Mm -hmm. So as soon as the uh, United Party was formed, uh, JB Dankwa started becoming Diminishing. politically insignificant, yeah. diminishing completely. Who made the decision to name Ghana Ghana? The decision to name Ghana Ghana is something that Everybody should know without question. And let me start from the beginning. You see, after the, uh, during the 48 riots, students and teachers from the three noted boys' schools in Cape Coast, at the Saddle, Augustus, and Infancy Pim, many of them have gone to town to join in the riots against the colonial government. And immediately, the white people realizing what was happening, they were always, it was white people who were teachers in those days and headmaster. They locked up the gates and then did a roll call. Mm. So all teachers and students who were caught outside gate around that time, when you don't have reason, that means you went to support that thing. And so they were sacked. And the committee of inquiry stated that they should not be admitted. Mm. And then Kwame Nkrumah went there to address these frustrated teachers and students. And then they felt that he, at that time, being the general secretary of the UGCC, could conveniently speak to the colonial administration to overturn their decision. Then Kwame Nkrumah told them, why do I have to beg a white man on my own land? If you will listen to me, it will help you. Mm -hmm. We are going to look for some building, somebody's house, and they will start a new school mm -hmm. and give it a name that will become the name of the future country we are building. Back in 48. Back in 1948, somebody's uncompleted building. They started a new school over there called Ghana National College, Osajifo's own school. 
So why do you allow someone to tell you that Ghana came from somewhere? Kwame Kuma himself, I told you, was a professor of black history in America. So he knew the ancient empire of Ghana, just as he knew the Berlin Conference and wanted us to go back to the beginning. He had read our history that the Gold Coast was a name that was used by the people who were stealing our gold away. So they gave it that name. You know, look at how it is. It's like uh, you, you are very rich, but I always get money from you. And then I call you Sikenino, mm -hmm. that rich man. So you may think it's a nice appellation, but the person is telling you are a fool. Mm -hmm. Then when I come, I get your money, well, I go, well, I get well, your money. So Kumafa, why should you call our land the gold code? Because you are enriching yourselves here. So we go back to that famous ancient empire. And that was in 1948, nine clear years before we had our independence. So he did he submit this name to the, go, the authorities that this is the name we wanted to? He submitted to it. And one good thing, incidentally, mm -hmm. when he submitted, and then on that day when he moved the motion, the, the, we call it destiny. Motion the of motion destiny. of destiny, destiny, the leader of the opposition, K.A. Buzia, also supported the idea that will be independent so and so did and then the country will be called that so please if it was any person buzia in fact founded a party just before independence which he called ghana congress party it was simply because it had spread everywhere that the country's name would be called ghana so he also chose the name Ghana Congress yes, Party. So he came to buy into Nkrumah's idea. But undoubtedly, if somebody could form a party in 1947 and call it United Gold Coast Convention, and another person could form a school in 1948 and call it Ghana National College, and then we win independence in 1957 and we call the country Ghana, then you should know that the man who called the country Ghana knew the name he would give to it because he was the one who started using it earlier on before everybody. We've taken a, a journey that has lasted hundreds of years from the founding of the Ghana Empire up until the founding of the Republic of Ghana, all in a quest to answer the simple question, who founded Ghana? What is your conclusion? My conclusion is that if you want to answer the vexed question, who founded Ghana? Go back to people who never had in mind giving us freedom, but the nature of their calling was such that they could be added to that subsection called the founders. And I've already mentioned Ekem Ferguson. Come to talk about this man, Philip Kweku, who became the first black Anglican priest, was the first African to have studied in Oxford. He didn't stay there. He came here and set up a school. Come to talk about uh, Jacobus Capitain, who studied in Holland, was given European name, Dutch name. He was so brilliant. And he was the first black person in the world to have become a Protestant priest. They wanted him to stay there because he knew Latin, he knew Dutch, German, English, all the European language. And he said, no, I want to go and work in the country where I come from. He came here, set up a school, and became the first person to have started translating the Bible into the Fante language. Come to talk about Agri, who in the 1921-22, he became the trustee of the Fred Stokes Foundation in the US, a, a fund set up for the upliftment of black people through education. So the American government brought him to Africa and he went to South Africa, Congo, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, Ghana, all projecting black education. I, can you talk about founders and leave such a person out? Now come to talk about uh, Mensa Saba, who defined uh, land in a manner that would stand up to our day. Those who funded the nationalists come to talk about Akweje, whom God used to bring in Kwame Nkrumah. Come to talk about K.A. Bedema, who 
who, if he had been a greedy and selfish person, could have become the leader of the party. And I believe the white man is a very, uh, 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 it's always a very smart person. If uh, Bedema had accepted what they were offering him, eventually the history of Ghana would have been different. They would have ditched he himself too, because Nkrumah's absence would have Balkana CPP into something else. Come to talk about Nana Sewaseajiman Prempe, who made Nkrumah strong because of the uh, 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 Ashanti Youth Association. Now go back, come to talk about the Nzima chief called Kinkekwaka, who was killed at Cape Coast Castle because he read the bond of 1844 that the Fanti chiefs had, and the Denchila and Asin chief had signed. And reading it, uh, he, not that he reading, they read it to him, and they were sending the whole thing to the entire coast that every chief should endorse. And when they read it to him, he told them that, but this is a mark of slavery. What you have read to me? If that is what my friends have signed, then they have signed away their freedom. And this man was arrested, brought to Cape Coast Castle, tried, and sentenced to solitary confinement, and died there. So when you go to Cape Coast Castle, you have three graves, Letitia Yee London, Captain George McLean, and then this man, uh, uh, Kinkeku Aka. Come to talk about the famous uh, uh, Ameto, Raphia Grill Ameto, a Ghanaian, a Gold Coast scholar, who in 1947, at the tender age of 33, was one of the greatest scientists in the world and was invited to the Nobel Peace Prize Laureum. Lorarium, and was one black person, the only black person there, and more than 1,000 white scientists. And the following year, he was runner-up to Nobel Peace Prize science section. Are you saying that you can leave him out of the founders? Because people like this made us to know that we can also aspire to wherever the white man is. And uh, Ameto was one of only three men in the world who knew the secret formula of the atomic bomb. And he was a black man, and he was a Ghanaian. Can you leave him out? Ameto was the only, the first person in the world to have written three books in three international languages, German, French, English. You can't leave him out. Come to talk about Ephraim Emu. His, his, his whole life, was the one that propelled us to where we are. And it influenced Kwame Nkrumah because he was a teacher at uh, Aquapon Training College. And they realized that this man had translated all the hymns into chi. And one thing, he was an Ewe man who didn't understand a single chi because of the fact that chi was influential and he wanted to influence his country. He learned Aquapin chi from the people and understood it and used it with an expert, expert efficiency. And everything in his house was African. He didn't use glass. He used kurakalabash. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't drink beer. He would drink, uh, what do you call palm it? Wine. Palm wine. Mm -hmm. And they saw him and they sat him from the school. And he said, me, I don't care. I will always be an African. And started composing plenty songs. Pushing if I look at Yenara as I see, and then more, more, more. A gentleman, gentleman, he had done for many a dipper gentry men. Damn, was he? Mama, 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 mama. Yeah, damn, was he? Mama, mama, And then he continues. Oh, sushi, moara. Oh, we are she, moara. Oh, come to moara. Mo bre bre yinara. Mo ma ye ye bi e jino. A gentleman, mama, mama, mama. A gentleman. Can you take away? this man. Mm -hmm. You can't. You can't. And then I've mentioned our great-great-grandmother Ya Asantiwa who, as a woman, was able to mobilize Ashantis who had otherwise been vanquished by the British and they were sitting down hopeless and then without anything to imagine apart from going to hold a conference and bringing the golden stool to the white man so that they will have their peace of mind. After all, the king himself had been taken to Sisha, and the woman got up and said, hey, you men, this is what you are going to do. You are lying. We are going to fight. Nobody will go anywhere. And with the start of the war, those people who knew where the golden stool were, was hiding and would have shown the white men were all killed by troops from Offenso. So it means that the golden stool got lost for a while. And so even though Ashanti was defeated, 
the aim of Yasantua was actually realized yeah. to protect the gold. Yeah. Can you talk about great men of Ghana, founders without hair? But I will conclude by saying that in every country in this world, we learn history in order to remember their celebrities. But all such countries have also got one founder which becomes the primus inter Paris. First among equals. And monk equals. And to that extent, when you mention India, you talk of Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi. Yeah. Russia, Peter the Great, Great. and then US, George Washington, Washington, South Africa, Mandela, uh, Ivory Coast, Hofua Bwanyi. And so in Ghana, you talk of Kwame Nkrumah. Professor Mills eh, of blessed memory. Please, he was a professor of law and he knew why he felt he had to create an independence for, sorry, create a holiday for that man called Kwame Nkrumah and named it the Founders Day, Founder Apostrophe S. before S because he was the founder of the nation. Ghana was founded on 6 March 1957 by a man called Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And he felt that with that, the whole Africa would see it as something to emulate. No wonder, therefore, that after he created the holiday for Kwame Nkrumah, South Africa also created the World Mandela Day for Nelson Mandela. Why would you argue that uh, South Africa would not think about Waters, Robert Sobikwe, Walter Sisulu, uh, Bantu Biko, Biko, and others? All those guys. No. Mm. Everybody has one founder, and it does not cause any injury, no harm, when you recognize the true founder of the nation. After all, you too, whatever you will do, you will be remembered. Mm -hmm. As I sit here, I remember Professor K. E. Buzia as the first Ghanaian professor of the University of Ghana. And I also remember Professor Anton William Amo, the first black scholar who flourished in Germany. I remember uh, uh, J.B. Dankwa as a man who flourished a lot in his writings. The African concept of God, he tried to interpret the Mahu in Ewe, the Tanyomo in Ga, and then the Akan yeah. one that Nyame, Winyanwa, Wame, and Obi Awe, Nyam, Nyam, Kupo, Nyame, Ajo. You recognize all of them. And so when somebody too has to be recognized as the founder of the nation, I believe that there should be no argument about that. So, yeah, I'm not sure from Pong, this has been a fascinating dive into history and uh, the question. Who founded Ghana? You have answered it. And I thank you so much. I hope I've answered it. Yes. <laughs> it remains to see what do you make of uh, the conclusion of this uh, question? Who founded Ghana? Put your comments down below. Let's have a conversation. And thank you very much for watching. Remember to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell so the next time fresh content comes, you'll be the first to get access to it. My name is Kafui Day. God bless you.